My brain is exploding. I don't know if your brains are, are hanging in. Uh, but it, it said that um, the script is great, and I'm not going to read it. I'm sorry, Casey. Um, one of the great things and, and one of the real blessings in, in all of our work here at Future Music over the last 15 years is the ability to um, work with and provide platforms for an incredible range of, of musicians who um, really take on the mantle of, of moving beyond. I think it, you know, very much the stuff that, that Josh is just talking about conceptually, uh, artists and bands and are, are, are doing amazing things in their community and working as forces for, for social change and, and really trying to be as intentional and impactful as they can with their activism and, and their philanthropy and they understand how all these pieces interconnect. Uh, in this conversation, which is going to be led by Ben Harbert here from Georgetown, he's been one of our strong partners in, in this uh, entire conference, we're going to hear four examples of, of folks who are really, uh, you know, kind of uh, walking the walk. And uh, for those of you uh, who were able to see him perform last night, you understand, you know, the amazing connection between their work as artists and the joy that they give all of us as, as fans of their music. And also to hear and learn more about what they do as activists and as, as uh, citizens is, is pretty remarkable as well. Ben. Thank you. So this is how I'd like to do this. I'd like to, to um, talk for a little bit about connections between these, uh, these four people who um, are here because of the incredible work that they do um, with music and with pressing social issues. Um, and in the in the spirit of Josh's talk, what I'm what I what I hope happens is a crossfade because there there is is no one artist activist, as as we'll see in the diversity here. But what I hope comes out of this is is a is a dialogue about possibilities, and and to see some efforts in this. So when I started thinking about about this topic about music and activism, I mean it seems like a well worn connection, right? But in the context of the Future Music Summit, it seems a bit unfair to me to put the burden of advocating for those who are in dire social and political and economic situations on musicians and artists who themselves are often in dire um, economic conditions. It seems grossly unfair to me. Um, musicians are in a precarious financial position and have to speak for the others. But there are some consistent themes, so I want to draw out a few consistent themes of why are artists advocating for those who are less fortunate, and how has that changed over the past several decades? Um, the consistent themes are that one, musicians especially often live near people whose political and economic situations are, are are challenging to say the least. Physically, we're close to the problems that, uh, that we don't see in, in wealthier parts of town. Um, and when you're close to people who are suffering, you can't help but pay attention to them and advocate for them when you can. Musicians know the outskirts of town very well, uh, not by conscription, but because often it's the only place where you can rehearse. That's why everybody's up in Baltimore now instead of Washington, D.C. But the outskirts of town, often musicians follow the gay community and find parts of town that are less affordable and you're not going to have noise complaints. In fact, I heard a band rehearsing in my neighborhood the other day and I felt so great. I wanted to go over and tell them, don't worry about it, just play as loud as you can until you stop. But to me, it just... It's, it's an amazing thing because what happens is then these communities are followed by people who then we could classify as the semi-adventurous, right, who move in and we often leave with them. And so that theme of proximity, of physical proximity to, to people who have certain social justice, justice needs, uh, we can think of Wayne Kramer who was living in Detroit as a musician who was living in Detroit during the 1967 uh, Detroit riots. And he was just telling me before himself had a, uh, was it a tank? Yes, a United States Army tank. An Army tank pointed at him. <clears throat> uh, we could think of this beyond American ghettos and at this point 
at this standpoint, in, uh, in our global world, the global ghetto, we have Ariana Delaware uh, returning to her native Afghanistan, to the ruins of her parents' home, and refusing to be just simply a new American, safe from the complexity of conflict, or not even a, a returning Afghani, Afghani shunning the, American, uh, the Americanisms in pursuit of some cultural purity, but she's chosen to stand in between, productively in between, defying the separation between America's, America's doings and Af the Afghani suffering standing in between. The other, so aside from proximity, there's also the idea that the artists have some sort of authentic voice, right? This voice that emerges as an authentication of the, com the commercial artist, right? We think of people like Pete Seeger, Joan Baez, or Bob Dylan 1.0 as expressively verifying the humanity behind the commodity. We can also think more subtly of Black Sabbath and War Pigs. We can think of the raw expression of hardcore punk, the oblique social commentary of post-punk songs about Fish Fingers and the Lone Ranger, about Riot Girl. That was a Wire reference, if you don't know that one. It's a great song. Um, but the problem is, is that the relationship between the artist and the activist is not stable. So while artists may advocate for political, social, and economic change, they themselves are subject to political, social, and economic change. In fact, their advocacy itself might be subject to political, social, and economic change. So we'll see how Stefan Brackett, MC of Flowbots, has adapted to these changes, how it takes as much effort to figure out how to affect political change as it does to continue a musical change in an active band. Um, I want to call our attention, I want to go back to the 80s. The large industry of popular music used to sustain this, right? There was a, a stable and, lar and loud platform for many types of social commentary. I think of 1989 as an interesting point where MTV added the image to the charisma, put the charisma of the artist and the public authority. Uh, we get the topical songs of Phil Collins and Another Day in Paradise, or Jim Cohen's poetic REM video, Talk About the Passion, in which images, plain images of the homeless in New York were set to the song, punctuated by a shot of a $910 million US intrepid. The 80s were a different time. <clears throat> now, mobs of people camp out in urban spaces, and that camping out takes on a new meaning. Today's media events, or as Daniel Borstein would call pseudo-events, are more likely to take place outside the Apple store. And as an afterthought, we hope that someone camping out on the sidewalk might, for a moment, identify with the homeless population. Their mind might wander to other disaffected populations and be moved to buy the red version of the latest electronic gadget, with proceeds going to fight AIDS in Africa, thanks to U2's Bono and Bobby Shriver as they've initiated a way of building in a percentage of activism in capitalism. Now, we're far from Pete Seeger leading college students in We Shall Overcome, because a lot has changed since 1985, and Bob Geldof and Live Aid, which through a maturing media, allowed two billion viewers into a pseudo-event transforming this concert of live aid into a mass political event, galvanizing consumers. This was a different model. This is when we thought we could galvanize consumers and build a solidarity and transform them into active citizens. There was an idea of a universal morality of salvation, an integrated spectacle of art and advocacy, of charisma and public authority. But media has changed. Narrow casting has done away with the possibility of a universal morality of salvation as a rock concert. We have fragmented audiences, a global reach, an intensified consumer-based economy. So one way to think of Live Aid is a type of ceremonial humanitarianism, a mass effort that's impossible today. Who is our community? We have no idea. Wayne Kramer has found community 
in our most vulnerable and least sympathetic, in prisoners, going into, prisoner, into prisons and giving them guitars, and challenging them to write songs, doing the political act of simply walking through the gates and drawing the spotlight on America's most pressing social justice issue, mass incarceration. But we've moved into another realm of what we might call post-humanitarian activism, where now we combine doing good with the pleasures of new media consumerism. We've moved towards a new pragmatic morality of celebrity diplomacy. And Jeb will talk about the Ally Coalition and how he works with the band Fun to draw attention to LGBTQ issues. And the band has found great success, not only in the new model of, of the music economy. Their song, if you don't know the band Fun, their song, We Are Young, topped the Billboard Hot 100 chart for six weeks. Um, and in part through branding with Apple, Chevrolet, they were on Gossip Girl and Glee, right? This is the, the new model of the industry. We're far from live aid. Likewise, their political efforts take place not only in the venue, but also in social networking and selling branded pins and t-shirts to draw awareness to people who feel alienated and invisible. So I'm going to turn this over and we'll run through each of these and, and attempt to crossfade. And, and I want to stress the point in handing this over is that music and activism should always be linked, not because of music, not because of artists, not because of the nature of any of this, but because we're citizens, because we're human beings. And this panel, I hope, will show us strategies towards these efforts with people making practical decisions in the changing la landscape of the musical world. So let's turn to Stefan here and Flowbots. When I was young, a rainbow got me to read. It taught me to dream. I caught thought recipes and found ingredients as deep as the seas and the subtlest secrets play in make-believe. Butterfly in the sky, I can go twice as high as your flight. If I imagine I may and imagine I might on the maddest of nights unlock the sky with the key and the kite. My fiend in for life at the zenith is like fiends who pipe into Venus and dight. The speakers to scream to the bleeding in sight. I invite the darkness but seek in the light. I'm keeping it tight and I'm seething to write speeches that deacons and demons recite. I want to be writing these wrongs and I'm writing these songs to keep on keeping on. I might weaken them bow, but I got to keep on. What's going to break first? Is it me or the dawn? I'm Br'er Rabbit from Flowbots, yo. And... Um... I'm really honored to be here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, so as far as talking about music and activism, um, I am the, one of the MCs in Flowbots, and uh, I am currently the board chair for our nonprofit organization, Youth on Record. But I actually want to talk about, I think it's very important to talk about how that began and what our process was to find ourselves affecting change. So I want to start at the very beginning. So this is where Flowbots began. Um, and I suspect for many musicians, uh, it, something similar may have happened. I'm not sure what we were jamming to, but um, a lot of these guys later on in high school were actually the members of the group that then became Flowbots, and then later on winnowed down into what we are now. And the main point that I'm going to try to make very quickly is that in music and in your activism, start with where you are and then stumble into both your sound and into your activism. If you go into music and you try to just like, duplicate somebody else's model, it will most likely be hard for you to sustain because it's not yours. Activism is no different. And I think that um, as you are looking for your way, like, start where you are. And I think a lot of other times like, people will go exterior and it doesn't work out for them. So with these guys in Denver, Colorado, playing music, reading comic books, falling in love with hip hop, and coming up in families that all like very much promoted social justice, that's where all of it started for us. So when the band was first, when the band had first gotten together, we have a very social message. And we have a message specifically that we're trying to speak to people's individual power. And um, 
So when we were creating the band, we thought it wasn't sufficient to just sing about people's power. We felt like you had to create some sort of bridge that maybe would allow people who were enjoying your music to then take themselves to their power. So we created a nonprofit organization. Um, we were very creative with the name. It was called flowbots.org. Um, and our first program was Fight With Tools. And Fight With Tools was our like, activism 101 workshop. We would create these very viral type of meetups that people could then sit down, discuss issues, and figure out how to identify an issue that they agree upon as a room, and then work on it on a local level. Um, and as long it was, as it was in Denver, it was working out pretty well. But then what ended up happening was that we ended up getting a hit on our hands. And we went from a local band to a national band. And then we took Fight With Tools nationally. And Fight With Tools ended up becoming a voter registration service because it was election season. So we got people coming to our shows, signing up people, registering to vote in all these cities that was going great. We had like over 50 street teams, over 10,000 people in the United States of America like registering folks to vote, to vote. It was incredible. After the elections, it collapsed utterly. We only had two staff members. We'd grown way beyond our capacity. And it did not work. It just didn't work. Um, we were teaching people how to critically engage power structures, and since once we stopped doing the elections, who do you think that they critically engaged? Us. Us. They're like, well, why do you need a 501c3? Aren't you buying into like a nonprofit industrial complex? Aren't you doing these things? We're like, yeah. And, um, and it was more than we could sustain with just two staff members. At the same time that we were doing Fight With Tools, we had an even earlier program where we were doing music programs in a residential treatment facility. And that continued. And so as Fight With Tools grew into flowbots.org um, larger, um, the Fight With Tools thing actually we had, to, we had to shut that down because it wasn't actually functioning. It didn't have to do with people giving us, asking us hard questions, it's that it wasn't really doing anything. And um, we went back to our roots, which were the music programs and the residential treatment facilities. And we kept on, so we had failed with the, the Activist 101 National Organizing. We went back, focused on Denver. We're doing our music therapy courses in an intense environment. And then we started expanding that. So then we had an opportunity to be in the Denver public schools at a middle school level. We did that for about a year because it's a real, we were invited into Denver public schools. And that worked OK because it was at the middle school level. And what we were doing were training Denver musicians to be music educators. But our curriculum was a little too advanced for middle schoolers. And then eventually what ended up happening is that we were able to shift into high schools. And that's when it really started being effective. So as that was happening, we were working with amazing youth from all over the city. And we're getting better and better at it. We're bringing in more Denver musicians, teaching in the classrooms, getting them paid so they can work maybe one or two less shifts at Starbucks. And they're working on their craft more. These kids are getting music. In, in schools where music, gym, recess have been taken out. We're, we're providing a very real resource. We're starting to get more and more things happening. When it first started, I was the main educator. I was the one who had teaching experience. I was the one sitting in these classrooms. I was the one overseeing and creating curriculum for all the different students. But then the very, very great thing happened. More capable people started showing up to do this. So we had gone from stumbling, failing, trying to find things, teaching curriculum that was inappropriately complex for middle schoolers, stumbling, 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 getting into high schools, getting great educators. Actually, one of them just stepped in. Etef, can you stand up for a second, man? Can you please give him a round of applause? <laughs> one of the amazing, amazing musician educators that we are privileged to have, people who can do it better than we ever could have imagined. And that was another essential thing. As we started getting closer and closer to what we were supposed to be doing, capable people showed up and helped us do it better. So this is a picture of our latest class of partner artists. These are the people who are in 12 different different public schools, four different residential treatment facilities in the state of Colorado, giving incredible music education and social justice, social problems classes. And um, we're very proud to be able to have these kind of musicians doing this uh, with us. And our programming, we feel, is something that is going to be beneficial not only for the students in the classroom, because I have a very real problem with people trying to do work and acting like they are saviors. We are not saving anybody. 
the young people that we are working with are brilliant, and we're just giving them opportunities to show that. And in the same way, these folks, who we, these musicians that we are working with are advocating on their behalf, but also we are helping them become better musicians, and then we're also making an investment into the city that gave all of us so much. Flowbots wouldn't have been able to get to where we were without Denver, and we want to make sure that Denver creates more opportunities for young people, for musicians. So we feel like our programming has to be holistic and 360 in that regard. All right, so what ended up happening is as the programs became more and more successful, we felt that we needed to have a place where our young people could take their music to the next level. At that point in time, we were taking our teachers and going to the schools, teaching them music, writing music, they were making their songs, but they couldn't take it higher. So we decided that we needed to try to find a place, make a studio, make classrooms where the young people could come and really make it happen. And we struggled for about a year. We worked with many different organizations, and we couldn't get the funding together. We couldn't find the place. Nothing was happening. And then what ended up happening is that the Denver Housing Authority, a federal entity, knew about the work, knew that we were looking for a place, and they were working on a new redevelopment where they are taking an old neighborhood and after interviewing the neighborhood for about five years, they talked with them about like, well, what, what would be better? This, this neighborhood that used to be the projects, we want to keep almost all of you here. We want to keep as many of you here as possible. So how do we go about revitalizing this without kicking you out? And in that process, what do you want? And they said, we want a place for our young people to do art. So they came to us. They were doing this revitalization process, and they came to us and they said, we will give you a space for your classrooms. We will give you a, a space for your studios, because we want you to provide your services for the people in this neighborhood. So this is us. These are three, three of the original members of Flowbot standing in front of the apartment building that below is where our actual studios would be on the main floor. And so it's just a beautiful way that you're seeing federal, state, and creative communities coming together to actually uplift. And I have to say, with my background, I was very hesitant when, some, when the feds came and said we're trying to make the community better. But um, they do have a very great model that's actually getting a lot of national attention. So this is the building now. The bottom floor, which you see right next to the studio, right, right next to the sculpture, that's where the studios will be. Where you see the uh, bay door on the left, that's where the actual music studio will be. And then the other, the other bay door is where the classrooms and the working stations will be. Um, I would, I would say that I'm really proud of the work that I've done, but I can't claim any of that. Um, those pictures that you saw earlier, the incredible staff, the board um, that we have, the people who really made it happen. We went from being in four different schools to now being in nine. We, two years ago, we started this campaign trying to raise $2.5 million. We're most of the way there. And uh, to make this amazing uh, building. So, to wrap this up, I think it's really important when you are going through these processes and trying to find out what it is that you're going to do, stumble through it on your own and take your failures and use them to build up towards what you're going to be doing. In the same way, if you're a musician and you're looking for your sound, if you're a musician activist and you're looking for the way that you're trying to work, there is a real synchronicity in failing and finding yourself again. So, it's back to kids lip syncing and jamming, going forward, stumbling, falling, finding. But, um, that's about it. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Ariana Delawari and I am a filmmaker and a musician. I'm Afghan American. And I'm going to cover a lot, and I'm just gonna do it really kind of generally so you guys can ask us lots of questions and, and ask me more specifically about my experiences. But to continue this sort of theme of stumbling through things, um, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles and I was born right after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And 20 days before I was born, our entire family fled Afghanistan and moved into our home. And so I was born in this house of like constant Afghan parties and celebrations uh, to, to keep their, their spirits lifted. And my father was an international banker at the time, but the year I was born, his entire cause became Afghanistan. And every dinner conversation my whole life was about Afghanistan and what was happening there. 
uh, I was also an artist, and I grew up somewhere between Ahmed Zaire and Ravi Shankar Records and Madonna and <laughs> the MTV and uh, Willie Nelson and Jimi Hendrix and playing the guitar, and somehow all of this was just what was inspiring me, but I didn't realize as a child how much it would shape my life. Um, when 9-11 happened, we knew that our father was going to move back to Afghanistan. And shortly after, he and my mom moved back to help rebuild the country. And my father has been very instrumental in rebuilding the banking system. Um, he's the current head of the Federal Reserve. Uh, so in 2002, I made my first trip to Afghanistan. And I was just at a film school, and I'd been an artist my whole life. But the second I looked out of the plane and saw the mountains, I knew that this was the purpose of my life and my heart just swelled with love and I was like, oh my, this is like my other home. <laughs> and so for a decade, I traveled back and forth documenting Afghanistan in photographs, film, and then I made an album there. Um, it was at a point when, you know, when we first went, it was this really exciting moment where we thought Afghanistan was free forever. And, you know, just falling in love with the country and making friends everywhere. And all of a sudden, we saw a Taliban resurgence and it started getting worse. And I, I started getting really worried. And I'd always had a dream to make an album there. And so I brought a couple of my American bandmates and we recorded with these three ustads or classical master musicians. And it was this incredible journey and it was incredibly challenging. Everything you could imagine went wrong. Generators dying. Uh, you know, communication failure, everything. Um, the album was was received well, really well critically, um, but I, I was totally heartbroken because the country was getting a lot worse. And so I decided that I, I needed to make this film. So I'm going to show you um, this trailer of, of a film I made called We Came Home. Four years ago, two of these girls were dodging Russian bombs in the homeland of Afghanistan. My name is Ariana Delawari. I was born in Los Angeles the year that the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. I was also born the year that my father discovered the purpose of his life, to bring peace to his country. I think it's a great mistake if the free world would ignore what's going on in Afghanistan. The Taliban banned all art. The name of the radio, television, and all music is banned. Because it's all the banners. The Taliban were starting to gain power again. What if I can never go back there? I want to go make this album now because we still can. We have to do this now. So as I was about to edit this film, a really amazing thing happened. Uh, I was totally upset about all of that I was seeing, and I, I felt kind of this feeling of despair. And right then I was invited by this organization called The Voice Project um, that uses music to create peace and ameliorate suffering in the world uh, to go to Uganda. And... Um, we were going to document these refugee women who create these songs of forgiveness called Dwagpako. I guess this is, this is the term for forgiveness. And the songs are aired on the radio, and it's been calling home these abducted 
LRA soldiers who were, who were abducted as youth, and they come home because when they were abducted, they were forced to kill their own people and do horrible things. And it was, it was like to create loyalty. And by hearing these women and their, their family members forgiving them, they're coming home. The UN did a study and 50% of the returnees come home because of the songs on the radio. So I went and these women blew me away. They were so full of joy and so incredible. I came back from this trip in Uganda and I had like seen this incredible example of forgiveness. And as I was editing my film about Afghanistan, I was like, oh my God, there's so much hope. All of a sudden I'm like, wait a minute, you know, there's this, there is, we, we can use music beyond our own impetus as artists who want to create change with our own songs and touch the world, we can use this as a tool beyond caring about, you know, yeah, the, the music industry is shifting and maybe we're not making the same amount of money or this or that, whatever. We have a tool now that can spread all over the world and we can create peace. And um, so after finishing the film, my life has just been a whirlwind. I, I got invited to Afghanistan to perform at the second um, Sound Central Rock Festival and um, I was the first woman of Afghan descent to play rock music in the country in over 30 years. And it was incredible, the response. I, I was totally petrified. I thought there might be a suicide bomber in the audience. I was like, I'm American, they might hate me. And it was this beautiful, beautiful experience. And the kids are so gracious, so moved, so excited. And I've seen in the last year things exponentially change in Afghanistan with the youth population. Um, after Afghanistan, I was invited to Somalia to play the first rock festival of Westerners in 25 years. Um, again, totally petrified, <laughs> didn't know, even worse, because it's not my people. And it was a huge success, and the people were so gracious. Um, so again, I saw how music, bringing music back can completely change everything and is this an incredible tool that we're not utilizing to its fullest potential. And I'll, uh, this was in Kabul, that's a, a shot of Sound Central Rock Festival. And I'm just going to end with something that my producers and I started recently. Um, it was totally on a whim. One day we're like, you know, why don't we... One of my songs is called Be Gone Taliban. We're like, let's make a poster that says Be Gone Taliban, Inspire Peace. And let's do this art campaign called Inspire Peace. And people, you know, 68% of Afghanistan are under 25 and almost 50% are under 15. So let's inspire Afghan youth to inspire peace. And let's just make this Be Gone Taliban poster and see if they download it and take a photo with it. Put it up. Didn't know what I was going to get. And these youth in Afghanistan took to it. And all of a sudden, I'm getting floods of emails with Afghan kids holding this Be Gone Taliban sign. And then one kid is like, you know, we need something about ethnic unity, you know. So we did one called Bravery and Unity. And then one kid said, you know, we need something about love. And so we did Afghanistan in my heart. And it's sort of taken off there. And all of a sudden, I, you know, I wake up in the middle of the night to these incredible images of... Afghans and people all over the world holding these signs that say Afghanistan in my heart. And it's just teaching me that sometimes it's the simplest idea. Sometimes it's a free idea. Sometimes you're not getting a paycheck for it. Sometimes you don't know what's going to happen and there could be a suicide bomber in the room. But if we are in this moment that's so exciting and we can write a new narrative together and we can get beyond ourselves and think about how powerful art and music is, and, and together I, I hope that maybe some minds in this room can think about ways that are beyond ourselves that we can create peace. Uh, my name is Jeb, and I was lamenting to these guys beforehand that I'm the only non-performer <laughs> on this panel, I'm including Ben as the professor that, so forgive me for not being as eloquent as these guys are. Um, I work with musicians to, I think Ben, you spoke about finding an authentic voice and this idea of stumbling into your art and stumbling into your, your activism. I help musicians with that stumbling and finding that voice, I, I hope. Over the last 15 years, I've 
worked with lots of musicians to help them build nonprofits and foundations. And in, I come, my, my background is in business and starting businesses and at, at some point I realized that I wanted to, I wasn't doing enough with the businesses that I was starting to, to change the inequality that I, I saw around me. And so, but I always had music and I, um, I remember the piano lessons my parents put us in when we were very young and uh, I'm, I've, I've got this frustrated artist piece of me so it's, I'm very fortunate that I get now work with musicians. And part of the, the music connecting me to this work is just understanding um, the, the inequality. And I start, as I said, I started a business with my brother in, right when we were out of college. And we employed a lot of immigrants, a lot of women who had just left Bosnia where there was a terrible war going on. And, under, and I understood that my brother and I had a role not only just to sell, we designed and manufactured clothing, it was not just to sell that stuff, but it was to in some way take care or help these women who'd, who'd come from a, a really horrible situation up into New England. And I, it, was, it was very apparent to me to see that, that I had been given a lot and it was my responsibility to do something with that other than just sell another hat, another, it was another piece of clothing. And the, I think stemming from that was this idea that there's so many huge problems in the world from you know, the work that you guys are doing in Denver and Afghanistan, and Wayne will talk about jails, uh, you know, thrown into that misogyny, uh, racial issues, the work I'm doing right now with LGBTQ equality. And it, a lot of the times this, this, we, we get thrown this challenge and it's difficult to know how to respond. And so that's where I like to enter the situation and, and help a musician respond and specifically trying to harness the fans. To, to me, that's the greatest opportunity for a lot of musicians in terms of activism is how do we harness these fans who come to a show? And right now I'm working with a band that has thousands of fans come to a show and it's, it's easy to make a bigger impact perhaps, but I've also worked with very small bands with tens of fans coming to show and there's always an opportunity to harness those fans. And I think then really connecting music and the history of music and we've heard Pete Seeger's name thrown out tonight and you know, what the Flowbots do and what Wayne did with MC5, you know, there's, there's on and on of musicians responding to inequality that they see. And I think now more than ever, uh, uh, there's a responsibility to act. And that's a word that the band I'm working with right now named Fun, the first meeting that I had with them, they talked a lot about their responsibility. They had just, you know, there was mention of the, the, their, that song that everybody knows that we've heard on the radio, and that had just hit when I first met with these guys. And they said to me, you know, we, we have a responsibility to, to use this platform for more than just selling another album. And their passion is changing the conversation around LGBTQ equality. And it's, it's so important now because you know, I can and you list off all the different issues and particularly with say youth where we're focused that LGBT youth are far more likely to be harassed to commit suicide than their straight peers. And what that, that at first glance is a huge, huge issue that how can a musician have anything to do with that or impact that? How can a fan base do anything with that? And so taking that challenge, we, you know, the guys asked me to respond at their tours, for instance. They gave me that platform to, to play in. And so we first started with a very simple sign that a lot of different organizations do, but it's a great method to involve a fan where a fan will, will get a sign and they'll fill in Ours first one was, I'm an ally, and I'm an ally because, and to push that, put that online. And so one of the first pieces of work we did is all the guys filled out their signs and we put them online and, and just, just start that conversation change. We've just come off a big tour. The guys were on tour for almost two years. And this last piece of the tour, I think was 50 cities. Um, and again, it was a great opportunity to, to harness these fans. We took along, they, they took along with them in a quality village, which is you know, six different tents, um, inviting local nonprofits in each of the different cities to come out, connect with the fans. These are local nonprofits working with specifically kids, with LGBTQ kids, helping them in each of the local cities. We raised a bunch of money. Um, and we also, I, I think, harnessed the fans by building an, an iPad app that let 
fans fill in, fill in their sign and then tweet that at a legislator saying, hey, Senator Rubio or, or Senator Warren, I'm up in Boston. And so it would, you know, Senator Warren, I would like you to care about safe schools, which is relevant legislation that's pending in, the con in Congress. And as a result of this last 50 days, we sent out 10,000 tweets. And it's 10,000 tweets that wouldn't have gone otherwise to, to local, to, to senators where each of these, or, and, and representatives where each of these fans are from. And so it was a way to, for the fans to, to, to connect on an issue, to connect with their rep elected representatives on an issue, and to, I, I think, move that needle on the conversation. Um, a good friend of ours is Erin Potts at Air Traffic Control, and she talked to, talks a lot about this need before we change laws is to change the conversation. And particularly in this issue of equality, how can we all change the conversation? I think starting with a simple sign, you know, fun is an, is an interesting position because they can do so much with their success, but um, you know, responding to a challenge with 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 something rather than you know in addition I mean in addition just to singing a song which is the I think you know, that's what artists do so well and you know that's where my frustration comes in that I can't respond like that but my response can be well helping these artists harness their fans and harness that social impact which can hopefully move the needle change the conversation and and in this particular case right now um, find equality and I'll leave it there and then take questions again. I'm Wayne Kramer, and uh, happy to be here with you today, this august situation, heart of academia, well-groomed people. Um, I got here um, because um, in the 60s, I was part of a generation that disagreed with the direction the country was going in. There was an agreement amongst all young people then. I'm not so sure there's an agreement today, but we had an agreement that the direction was wrong and our frustration with the slow pace of change instigated us into radical and militant action. Um, we had a rock band. We felt like our band was a good way to be like the underground news service. We could write songs about what's going on in our neighborhood and in our lives and in our country and what we thought was wrong. And, we also felt that that wasn't going to be enough, and we aligned ourselves with the Black Panther Party because they had asked for a group in the white community to form a parallel group, the White Panther Party. And uh, we suffered uh, greatly for our efforts. Uh, the MC5 was uh, arrested and indicted and jailed and kicked out of the music business, and the Black Panther Party uh, suffered death squads across America. Police murdered Panthers. Um, we embraced violence and it was a, a mistake. Um, I ended up in federal prison. I'm an archetypal drug war prisoner. I needed money, seemed like an easy way to make some money. I'm not very good at being a gangster. I'm not a gunslinger or a killer, I'm a guitar player. Um, the judge didn't care. And, uh, and I watch now that the judges haven't cared, or maybe they cared, but they couldn't do anything with mandatory minimums and these uh, atrocious, severe sentences that guys just like me and women, regular people, have been sent to America's prisons in ever-increasing numbers over the last 30 years 
First it was tens of thousands, then it was hundreds of thousands, and today we have 2.3 million of our fellows under lock and key. We have 10 million American citizens under direct state control, direct law enforcement authority control. Uh, this pissed me off. This uh, frustrated me. Um, and, and I don't think I'm unique in that regard. I think there's great disappointment in our world today. Uh, our, our, our giant institutions, uh, politics and religion, have failed us. And that failure gives rise to meaninglessness, a form of nihilism. And that can be a soft nihilism like uh, ben referred to, like, oh man, do I want the red iPad or I want the blue iPad? I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to study Kabbalah. I'm an American Buddhist. I've got my family. I'm all right. Heck with the world. Disengage with the world. Or there's the hard form of that, which is, of course, gangsterism and Al Qaeda, violence, terror. So, how do we militantly oppose? this meaninglessness. I would suggest that ethical action, positive action, action that moves in the direction of human happiness and away from the direction of human suffering. And how can I do something? I'm an ex-offender. I'm a musician. And I ran into the great British troubadour Billy Bragg and he was doing some work in England helping people that worked in prisons use music as a tool for rehabilitation. And he called it Jail Guitar Doors. Jail Guitar Doors happens to be the name of a song by The Clash. The Clash were MC5 fans and they wrote this song about me when I went to prison. So I thought, well, all signs are pointing to Wayne. You better uh, step up here. And I took this on for America, me and my wife Margaret Kramer and Billy Bragg formed Jail Guitar Doors USA. And what we do is simple. We find people that work in corrections that are willing to use music as a tool for rehabilitation. We know through empirical studies that participation in arts and corrections programming reduces recidivism. There's a thing that happens in music and in all of art that connects you back with your humanity. It teaches you the secret of how to work, how to concentrate, how to focus, how to stay in one spot and accomplish a task. This is an important ability, this important skill to have in the world. You have to do it when you're doing your schoolwork. You've got to sit there and get the job done. You've got to absorb this stuff. That only art can bring about a change of heart, a fundamental change of perspective, the way one sees him or herself in relationship to the world. And it's the beginning of a, of a rehabilitation process. It's not everything, but it's, it can be the start. It can be the spark plug. So today we're in about 40 American prisons. Uh, we've got a waiting list of another 50 prisons. Uh, yes, Sunday we went in Patuxet, up in Jessup, uh, Ben went with us and he was brilliant. Uh, and we dropped off a load of guitars. Tomorrow, I'm going to go to Philadelphia and drop off another load at the Philadelphia County Prison System Complex. And we have some local musicians up there. What we do is kind of like a uh, anarchist franchise. Um, I inspire other musicians to put on their own benefit concerts, raise their own money, buy their own guitars, take them into their own local jails and prisons where their friends and families are serving these uh, severe sentences. You know, prison is one of the pillars of an advanced society. Prison and health are the, are the two things that hold up an advanced society. And what we're doing as regards prisons is an embarrassment and a disgrace. These are, this is the care of our own people. We're locking people up at a rate that's unprecedented in all of history. America has 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. We lock people up for longer sentences than any country, China, Russia, Yemen, anybody, were the worst 
It's nothing to be proud of. The good news is that people made this mess, and if people made this mess, people can fix it. And uh, the answer to that meaninglessness in taking ethical action is what all my brothers and sisters here are doing. I hope it's what uh, you all will be doing. Um, you'll find that you'll gain uh, a connection with your fellows. And it's all about connection. As humans, our species is the most connective of all the animals. We need to connect. The answer is in engagement, involvement, and in connection. It's not in isolation and, and get mine. I think that's 10 minutes. Thanks. <laughs> It's hard to be timely, but we were timely, so we have time for questions. I just want to ask us, um, ask all of you um, to, I, I'm, Josh, I'm going to borrow your metaphor of the crossfader yet again. So what we have is we, we have the archive here, and this is an amazing archive of, of people who are doing work with music that uh, reaches beyond and affects change. So that part is done. What I would like now is for you all to be the crossfaders or to put your finger on the crossfader and try to direct questions that hit themes or that involve the multiple voices at this table. Um, so if you have a specific question for them, I'm sure you all will speak to them, right? Yeah, right. And so any general ones? Ben, just a mm -hmm. bit of housekeeping. Are we gonna be able to do the session this afternoon? Yeah, yeah. Did you announce that yet? I'm sorry. Yeah, so um, w Wayne and I are going to speak about jail guitar doors. What time is that? We'll figure that out. We'll figure that out. We're going to have a time if you want to drill deeper on jail guitar doors. We have a, a time for that later today. Right, so specific questions, hold off. General questions, let's have them. Hi, great panel. I'm Judy Tint. I'm an attorney and consultant and a hippie activist from way back based out of New York. And... I'm so gratified to see that there are panels of this nature popping up more and more at industry conferences. I heard Jeb speak a couple of weeks ago at CMJ. So my question in a world where there's so many causes, and the good news is that musicians have become increasingly involved in all this amazing work, but what I sometimes find challenging is that not just donors, but artists themselves are so inundated with requests for various causes and various wonderful initiatives that it gets tough to connect with the right people. So I'm just curious if there are particular tools that you use or that you might recommend for people doing work of service in order to reach the musicians that they want to help in their advocacy. Thanks. Send them an email. Ask them. It's really not too complicated, I don't think. Just reach out. I mean, yet we have to be able to say no, you know, so we can't do everything for everybody, but if you don't ask, we can't, we can't say no. So I think just ask. Just make the connection. It's, it's never that complicated. We, we make it more complicated than it needs to be. Okay. Jeb, you're in the business of this. Do you, do you have? I, 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 again, like what Stefan said about start you are and stumble into it and this idea that if, um, if you care about what's going on in Afghanistan and, and just starting and doing something about it and so then she starts to be known for her work in Afghanistan or if it's in Uganda and I would imagine the people who would want her to come and work at the local blood bank probably wouldn't reach out to her because she's becoming more and more known for her work in Afghanistan. So I think that for me it's, I most enjoy working with musicians who want to work with me. And so from the very, from the smallest ones to the biggest ones and they're the ones who, uh, the, one of the first musicians I worked with does a lot of work with volunteerism and before every single show he does, and he's in two or three different bands, he always insists that there's a service project in the city where they go. And it doesn't matter the size of the show, he, he does that. And so now that's, he's known for working with volunteerism. And so people are more, more people like City Year, which is a great organization out of Boston, is more, much more likely to reach out to him for support than, again, a blood bank. Um, I, is this, 
This one. I find that um, I'm I'm having to say no a lot more now than I used to. But what I have also happening is a network. So there's like all these incredible young Afghans that are like, how do we help? What do we do? You know, and and all these young bands who are coming up. So I'm like, well, if I can't do it, I can direct you to foot soldiers or like these amazing up and coming bands that I would rather them have the opportunity anyway. So I think like, yeah, like stumble as you go and and maybe even if you get a no, you'll might you might take you to what's supposed to happen. Thank you. Oh. Uh, hi, I'm I'm Joel Palmer uh, Pomerantz, and I I help to run a, a music and arts and culture and political space here in the D.C. area, and um, you know, I, I'm just sort of, you know, there's a lot of great music that goes on and a lot of things that come, but I'm I'm finding in a certain there's a certain degree of people walking with their heads down and just sort of getting through and very narrow focus. I'm fine. I've been with this space since 2001. When we first started, there was a lot more community engagement. And after 9-11, that seemed to go down like fall off a cliff. And I'm, I'm wondering about ways to engage that and to open people's minds, because people are very specific now. It's almost, when I describe it to people that talk to me, it's almost like the acting machine, the acting exercise machine, where one person only wants to turn their arm this way and one only wants to move their leg that way, and, it's, it, and they're not connecting. And I'm just wondering if there's any advice on that. Thanks in terms of the general public and not just the musical community? I think we have good examples right here to, to follow that. Um, do we have time for another? How are we on time? No, okay, we're out of time. So you follow up with all of these individually. Thank you all. <clears throat> Thank you. So quick house.